Great. Let's start. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning, um, everybody. I know we have people tuning in from everywhere around the globe, and I'm delighted to host a very special talk today with a very special host. Um, so hi, Nan. Welcome. Um, hi, really thanks for having me. Very happy to, to have you today. So maybe a quick word for the very few who wouldn't know you um, yet. Um, you have a strong background in product and strategy. And for over two years now, you're leading the climate efforts at Stripe. And that included the first fund um, announced in 2019 and an action in 2020 um, that kickstarted the carbon removal market and the carbon removal industry with some direct purchases. Um, and more recently, obviously, uh, with the announcement and the creation of Frontier, so an advanced markets commitment um, that you will uh, talk about today for the, for the benefit of the group. So nearly a billion dollar along with Alphabet, Meta, Shopify, and, and McKinsey, um, really with the objective of accelerating the market for carbon removal and getting to the necessary scale that, that we need to have. Um, so before we hear from you, uh, maybe a quick overview of the hour that we have in front of us. So we'll, we're very eager to hear from you, from you on Frontier, its origin, its objectives. Um, then we'll have a discussion after those 10 minutes, a discussion on its impact on the market, the challenges, uh, and maybe the next steps that are ahead of, of you and, and, the, and the team. And we'll close with some questions from, from the audience, um, obviously. So thanks again very much uh, for being here and we look for, forward to uh, your presentation and uh, starting that about Frontier. Thanks very much. Great, thanks Julie for the introduction and hi everybody. Um, it's great to be in a virtual room with you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen if I can. Great. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm gonna spend 10 or 15 minutes talking a little bit about what Frontier is, the origins of Frontier and sort of what we're aiming to do over the next uh, eight years. So um, please keep track of questions that you have and Julie will facilitate those uh, at the end. So as Julie mentioned, uh, we just announced Frontier, which is an advanced market commitment to buy almost a billion dollars of permanent carbon removal by 2030. Um, funded by this initial suite of founding companies. Before I talk about Frontier, I'll talk a little bit about the genesis of it. Um, so where did we start? Um, Stripe is a company that builds economic infrastructure for the internet. We are not a, a quote unquote climate company. And our foray into carbon removal really started in 2019 as a small corporate kind of um, a, a very small corporate commitment for a million dollars to buy permanent carbon removal and importantly, we sort of said that we would buy this at any available price. We were not looking to buy the cheapest ton that we could find. The initial purchase was uh, really grounded in climate science, right? So this is a chart that I'm sure many are, are very familiar with, but in addition to emissions reduction, we are also gonna need to do a huge amount of carbon removal to achieve global net zero. Um, and while we have some of the solutions that we need today to do that, like planting trees and soil carbon sequestration, it's very unlikely that those solutions by themselves are going to get us to the roughly six gigatons per year of carbon removal that we're gonna need by 2050-ish. Sort of obviously depends on the model you're looking at, but for shorthand, we'll say six, six billion tons a year by 2050. Um, Part of the reason that we are going to need these, right, is that we are gonna run out of arable land, right? You can only plant so many trees before you don't have, uh, you don't have additional um, uh, acreage um, that you need also for other things like growing food um, and, and other important uses. The problem with the sort of companies, the, the solutions in that like blue chunk at the bottom, the, the quote unquote new solutions that we're gonna need um, is that first of all, they barely exist. And second of all, the solutions that do exist are really early and their early solutions tend to be really expensive. Um, this is a sort of a similar phenomenon that we've seen in solar panels and hard drive and DNA sequencing or even Tesla, right? Uh, new technologies start off really expensive and they get cheaper over time as they scale. 
Um, so we had sort of said, we're effectively buying the Tesla roadsters of these companies with the idea that if they have the ability to get to a low cost and a high volume in the future, we're happy to be an early purchaser to help them sort of accelerate down that trajectory. That was the initial thinking behind our, our, our initial million dollars. And we came up with a set of target criteria to sort of characterize the gap that we saw in solutions and really define what it is we're looking for. There are a number of criteria, but I'll highlight the top four because I think this is what makes us a little bit different from other purchasers. First, we're looking for carbon that is permanently stored, um, which we generally talk about as more than a thousand years. We also wanted to take advantage of carbon sinks that are not constrained by arable land. And this really gets back to the point that um, some of the mature solutions today that we have are tend to be you know, very land hungry. And so we need to complement those with other solutions that don't, that don't do that. And then the last two, cost of capacity, we're okay if these solutions are expensive and small scale to today, so long as they have a glide path to being sub $100 a ton at scale, and more than half a gigaton a year. So we want it to be a meaningful, have the potential to be a meaningful chunk of the portfolio. With our initial million dollars, um, well, this is a 14 companies with a bit more than that million dollars, but essentially the kinds of things that we're looking at here are really all over the map in terms of the kinds of approaches that they're taking, right? It's Climeworks, um, of course, pioneering some uh, direct air capture. We have Charm, which is pyrolyzing waste biomass and injecting that underground as bio oil. Running Tide, which is growing kelp in the open oceans and then sinking it. Um, so just to give you a flavor, there's a lot of different ways to approach carbon removal. Um, and we, by the way, need to see a lot more than you know than these uh, than these approaches that you're seeing. But um, just to give you a flavor, it's not all direct air capture. It's not all one thing. There's really a, a range of solutions, and we're going to need a portfolio. So after we made our initial million dollar announcement, two things happened. One, the carbon removal community had sort of a strangely positive reaction, which mostly told us that this field had been so starved for customers that anybody really cared about an initial million dollars. And the second thing that happened was we got a lot of outreach from Stripe businesses that, you know, Stripe has 2 million plus businesses all over the world. And a number of them reached out saying, hey, you know, we wanted to do something in climate for a while, but we haven't, because it's hard to figure out what to do. If we give you some money, could you figure out what to do with it? And it was the combination of those two insights that ultimately formed the genesis of what's now called Stripe Climate. And this is generally sort of phase two, right? Phase one is the initial million dollar corporate commitment. Phase two is Stripe Climate, which aggregates uh, funds from any company that wants to opt in, we pull those together and use it to buy even more carbon removal down the cost curve. And this is, you know, takes a business three clicks to set up and they'll direct an ongoing fraction of their revenue to carbon removal. At the end of 2021, we had more than 20,000 users. We had spent $15 million across those 14 companies. That, uh, that you just saw. And we were the first customer for 11 of 14 of them, just to give you a sense for how early this ecosystem really is. So about um, around this time last year, actually, no, I guess it was uh, in the fall or late summer, we got into a room as a team and we said, okay, well, on the one hand, there's been a lot of momentum. You know, we have companies that are starting to buy carbon removal. We're starting to move faster. We're starting to see things shift a bit. At the same time, this field is still nowhere near on track to get to this, this gigaton scale that we need in the time frame that we have. Part of the problem is that there is a huge supply shortage. So even though, you know, for, for 14 of these companies, for many of those, we are already buying carbon removal years into the future because there's such limited tonnage available today. That's a problem, right? I mean, there's, there's the supply just isn't there. It takes time to build new technology, it takes time to scale new technology, and it's just not there. And part of the reason there's a big supply shortage is that historically, there haven't been buyers. Um, if they're, you know, if you're starting a company, and there are no customers, you know, it, it takes guts to start, start that company. And it's a real risk. Uh, and Climeworks, you know, was was very, very early to this game. Um, uh, I think you're, you have to have been Julie, one of the first, if not, you know, the first direct yeah, air, one of air capture. Companies. Yeah, yeah, one of Within 12 years. Um, ago. Right, right. It was quite a long time ago. Um, but so, you know, there's been supply shortage because there haven't, hasn't been customers. Climework is, has been the exception here. 
And that is a, there is that sort of uncertainty around um, around the market is is reasonable, right? There haven't been customers. So if you're an investor, why do you want to put money into a company that doesn't have revenue? If you are an entrepreneur, why do you want to start a company if you're not sure that you can find customers? And then finally, we really, you know, 2050 sounds like it's far away, but it's really not. And I think that we have to compress 10 to 15 years of, develop, of this field developing on its own into the next three to five years if we really want to have a shot at scaling carbon removal to a meaningful part of the climate suite of solutions here. So we sort of looked at this problem and we said, okay, if our goal is just to get carbon removal on its best possible trajectory, what would we do? We came up with a bunch of ideas, we killed a bunch of ideas, and one of the ideas that we couldn't kill uh, was the uh, idea that we launched um, uh, about this time last month. So we launched Frontier, this advanced market commitment for carbon removal. The concept of an advanced market commitment is borrowed from vaccine development, where um, certain drug development faces similar problems. So if you want a drug for a potentially low income country, like a malaria vaccine, or even the pneumococcal vaccine for a low income country, pharma companies don't want to, aren't incentivized to spend the time and resources developing the vaccine and deploying the vaccine because they're not sure that the customer base is going to be large enough to, to justify the cost. So back in the early 2000s, economists had this idea where if philanthropists and governments could pool money together and say, hey, here is a pot of revenue for whoever can build this thing, we will buy X million doses at Y price. Uh, they might be able to pull suppliers into the space. And they tried this on the pneumococcal vaccine and it worked. Um, uh, essentially, this is a way to, the, the spirit of a advanced market commitment is to guarantee a market for something even before it necessarily exists. It's to send a demand signal to researchers and entrepreneurs and investors that there is going to be a market for this. And there are some very big differences also um, between vaccines and carbon removal that we can discuss if folks are interested, but that's kind of the, the sort of uh, etymology of the concept, so to speak. How does Frontier work in practice? So um, the first step here is Frontier is aggregating demand to, uh, from a number of different buyers. And we have the initial founding buyers um, to start. And I'll note that uh, Stripe's commitment is made up of both Stripe corporate commitment, as well as the, the predicted aggregation of the Stripe climate users. So there's tens of thousands of businesses that are going to help make up this as well. So it's the founding companies and then you know, the tens of thousands of businesses that, that contribute already through Stripe Climate. We aggregate the demand and essentially what happens is each buyer sets a maximum amount that they're willing to spend in a year for carbon removal. Um, Frontier, which is made up of technical and commercial experts, goes out and finds and vets different technologies. I'll mention that there are two tracks here. Um, there is a track one, which is early stage purchases. And this is for early companies that are just getting started and looks very similar to what we've done already through Stripe Climate. These are small purchases, $500,000. Um, and we give them to the company now before they give us the tons. They're essentially a pre-purchase that could sort of feel like more of a grant, but we are getting the tons if and when they materialize. Um, the second track is for larger state, uh, later stage companies in the form of offtake agreements. And these are financially binding agreements that Climeworks or anyone else could take to a bank and use them to get project financing for uh, a later stage deployment. And in this case, the money doesn't go out until the tons are received. So there's sort of a, that's the critical difference between the two, but the reality is the field is so early that you have to do the first to help these companies get started. You can't just do the second because there aren't that many companies that are even at the point where you could write, write an offtake uh, currently. So we're trying to effectively meet the field where it is here. And then finally, um, suppliers remove carbon and pass back the ton to buyers. And the buyer in this case um, effectively is purchasing, it gets to benefit from this portfolio rather than just entering into a single offtake agreement with a single customers. So what's really unique about this is that there is no ton target and there is no price target. Um, our macro goal here is to get 
carbon removal on its best possible trajectory. So for the companies that we are entering into an offtake agreement, we want to believe, we want to have high confidence that that offtake is going to accelerate it down a steep cost curve and accelerate it up a, a steep volume curve. We really want to catalyze new supply rather than compete over the supply that exists today. In practice, this is all illustrative, but I think it's it, it's sort of helpful. Um, this the height of the bar here uh, is essentially the sum total of the dollars that each, um, each buyer has put into the pot, right? So this is how much we can spend max. Um, the line, the orange line is the price that comes down over time. And we think that it's gonna take, it's gonna be kind of slow at the beginning because these companies are just getting started. They're just like, the tonnage isn't very high. These are new companies that are really perfecting and, and really figuring out the core of their technologies. Um, and then the split in the blue and the, the, the blue bars, the light blue bars is track one. It's those pre-purchases that I was talking about. And we think that, you know, again, these made, numbers are a bit made up, but the, the spirit here is to communicate that in the early years, it's going to be um, especially, pre-purchase will be an important part of the, the entire funding portfolio because the field is early. And as the field gets more mature, we'll switch more to track two, which is the off-takes, um, which is really where you're gonna see the, the real volume. So we can enter and can and will enter into off-take agreements you know, in the early years, but we don't think that the cash will actually change hands until the later years once the facility gets built and the cash uh, and the tons actually get delivered. So I'll end in just one minute, but um, you know, to, to sort of summarize here, we know we need a gigaton scale, gigaton scale portfolio of carbon removal solutions. We have to pull forward 10 to 15 years of development into the next three to five. This is a really critical year to start new companies and figure out what the plans for scale, scaling them up um, is. And in order to do this, we need more buyers and we need more suppliers on the buy side. You know, this at 6 billion tons at $100 a ton, we're talking $600 billion per year. By 2050, this is 1 billion over nine years. There's a very large gap uh, between those two numbers, and we're going to have to make it up with a combination of private sector voluntary uh, commitments, as well as accelerating policy to really make sure that they, there's a, a strong compliance market. Um, but early purchasers and early buyers can really help, you know, one, $1 billion is not enough. It is not the whole market and is not enough to justify um, to justify, you know, every investor swarming in on this by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a start and it's an important start and early buyers can really have a catalytic impact by getting involved early. And then finally, you know, there are so many, if you're thinking about starting a carbon removal company that's building to the criteria that I, that I outlined before around permanence, um, and cost and capacity and, um, uh, land constraints, et cetera. There are so many buyers and investors that want to support you and help you in that journey. Um, we, you know, there really has never been a better time to start a carbon removal company. So if you're doing something or thinking about it, um, please let us know. You can reach us at suppliers at frontier at climate.com. Um, we'd love to hear from you, but, uh, I, I guess my hope today is that this gives you a little bit of a sense of why we need this, what we're trying to do here. And, um, you know, compels you in whatever capacity that, that means to, to get involved in the space. That's all I got. Julie, back to you. Excellent. Thanks so much. I think it's an amazing introduction and understanding the journey, you know, you've been through um, at Stripe and then how this, that expanded into an overall kind of industry movement. And I think that that's very inspiring. Um, so my first question would be about, you know, this, this movement and its inspiration, right? The, the aim of Frontier was to send a strong signal to the market, but also to entrepreneurs, um, you know, and to other companies and, and researchers and investors. Um, how was the response so far? What was the traction you felt most? What was the response you got? I think the response has been like overwhelmingly positive. Um, we have tried really hard in developing this concept and in launching the concept to involve a pretty broad group of experts um, on the, in the science community and the academic community uh, with the economists who developed the initial AMC um, and with other buyers and suppliers. And I think that that um, that is, that paid off. I mean, it, it, I think that the response has been overwhelming in um, 
a couple of years ago, like people, it wasn't even clear that we needed, I don't think it was clear to most folks that we needed to do carbon removal in the first place. And I think that the response is a testament to like the work that everybody in this field has been doing to try to build, um, to build up that momentum. Yeah, no, great. Um, I think one of the question we already got was to understand maybe double click for a minute on, on really the why, right? So one part of the question we're getting is like, how is this financially interesting for a company? Um, and on the other hand, what, like, why are people, like, why are those different companies? So Stripe, but also your partners getting into that. Is that something purely for the scale up of the, the market and the supply side? Or is that aim as well as um, working against their own footprint, for instance? It's a good question. The, so just to clarify, there are no kind of financial gains or benefits. So we are purely acting as a customer. We don't get equity or financial return. We get the tons back, but they're kind of inefficient tons and in that they are priced quite high, um, highly compared to a company's quote unquote alternative. Um, the rationale for doing this is a little bit different for each company. So I won't speak for all the companies, but I can, I can certainly speak for Stripe. Um, more and more companies are making net zero commitments and more countries are making net zero commitments. And we know that carbon removal is an important part of climate solutions that we need to develop. And if you look at the situation with sort of very clear eyes, the supply just doesn't exist today. Um, it, it does not exist. And so we can do all the kind of fancy accounting we want to try to get tons that are delivered in a year, but like in if, if the supply existed today, like we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in. And so the, the motivation for um, Stripe and, and other companies is one, you know, in the long run, we're trying to make sure that the supply does exist for companies that have made voluntary commitments to meet those, uh, to meet those, uh, meet those commitments. But two, it is also a little bit philanthropic um, in nature and that we are, you know, we're, we are overpaying per ton. Um, I, so I think it's, it's sort of a, a bit of a hybrid um, and it depends on the company, but like the reality is that the supply doesn't exist. So I think the faster that we can sort of accept that reality, the faster we can move to actually coming up with solutions that are going to pull new supply in rather than just compete over the small supply that exists today. Definitely. But would the quantities both via Frontier account for each footprint of the company or that would be additional or they could? Um, they can. So like, we're not dictating what a company does with those tons. It's totally up to them. So yeah, it's at their discretion. Yeah, no, fine. And maybe um, another question or topic that's um, getting some traction in, in, in the audience is maybe you can explain a bit more details on the governance. You know, you mentioned a group of experts that was included into the, the, the ways of working and the decision-making process of Frontier. How, how does that work exactly? Like, how did you choose the right people? Yeah, so Frontier is a wholly owned subsidiary of Stripe and it's run by the Stripe climate team or a subset of the, the Stripe climate team. Um, there are a number of different types of expertise that we need to achieve our mission of getting carbon removal on its best possible trajectory. And we've sort of um, categorized them generally into a couple of different buckets. So we have the founding advisory, sort of the, the, the founding members are, are on a board together. So this is you know, Alphabet and McKinsey and Meta and Shopify and Stripe, we sit on um, a board to represent the buyers. Um, we also have the um, sort of commercial and technical expert advisor panel, and this is um, the AMC economists, it's scientists, it's investors in the carbon removal community to sort of help advise on some of key, some key strategic decisions um, that we would be making. And then we also have our technical and commercial experts that we use and, and sort of talk to on a um, on more of like a contracted basis for evaluating applications. So for example, when we are deciding on projects, we will have, we'll develop an application as we've done with Stripe Climate. We've done three cycles of this so far with Stripe Climate, an application, um, projects fill that out and submit it. 
we have two science and one governance um, advisor reviewing those applications. They then give us um, their sort of read, we synthesize it and Stripe now Frontier is ultimately responsible for making those decisions um, on sort of what, what, who to buy from and how, and how much. But I think what's so interesting and, and to me really energizing about this field is there's so many different, this is building a new ecosystem from scratch and you need a lot of different types of expertise to help kind of nurture and mature this ecosystem. It's not just one, it's not even just, you know, one type of science or one type of um, sort of market building. It's, it's, it's all of it. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we're, we will continue to add to this over time, but like the spirit is let's make sure that we have the right folks in the room helping, helping inform our decisions. Excellent. So let's talk a bit about the homework, you know, of, of these people in the, in the chart you showed earlier with a light blue and dark, dark blue bars, yeah. right? Um, there were some pre-purchases showing up as early as 2022. So what are mm -hmm. the kind of immediate next step and the timelines you foresee for action? For Frontier? Yes, great question. So we had announced, um, we had announced, had not announced Frontier back in, I think it was February when we put out our call to, uh, our call for application. So Stripe Climate has been, we started doing one purchase cycle a year. We've now moved to two purchase cycles a year and we announced that purchase cycle back in February. So we're gonna be announcing those purchases coming out. We've shifted those over to Frontier. So Frontier's first purchases will be coming out in the coming months um, from the initial call back in February. We're going to be doing another round um, this fall. And so for folks who haven't applied to Stripe Climate yet or um, in this last round, that is a great time um, to sort of shoot for. We will probably release an application in like September or October timeframe, but would love to see, um, again, take a look at our criteria. They're on frontierclimate.com um, to see what we're, what we're targeting, but that's kind of the, the next big, um, the next big date and would love to, would love to see as many, as many ideas and promising stuff um, that folks are working on as possible. Excellent. To that point, someone was asking on the chat, um, is there any timeline or minimum or maximum timeline for delivery in the case of pre-purchase? Do you, do you have a time window on that? It's a really good question. And then, candidly, I think it's something that we go back and forth about quite a bit. Um, the general rule of thumb is we, we want the delivery to be within a couple of years of when we're making the purchase. Um, it, we certainly don't expect that it's within the same year, but we, we want it to be within a couple of years. Um, that said, yeah, I, we, we've sort of, we, we can stretch that a little bit, but we, we don't, we want this to be further along than a, just an R&D project. Okay, clear. And um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is how do we compress, right? The scale up timing from 10, 15 to three, five years. And you know, I believe that for that, there are two directions, right? One is seed funding. So really helping companies to emerge and that's kind of your light blue area, right? With the pre-purchase, but also the scale up part of it. Yeah. Do you already have an idea on how the kind of the money or the volume will be distributed in between these two directions more or less? Yeah, so if you if you remember that bar yeah. chart that I showed, most of the dollars will be spent in the form of offtake. That's where most of the tons are going to be, That's right? Um, I think it's the as a percentage of the total spent in any given year. In the early years, more funds will go to pre-purchases just because that's where the field is. And we don't exactly know yet, right? I mean, I think we're we're, we're trying to meet the field where it is, yeah. But but most dollars will will. <laughs> There's not that much to buy right now, so. Um, maybe another area I wanted to um, discuss with you is all around verification and standard, right? So the development of measurement and verification standard for carbon removal is still in early stage. How how does the expert team that you mentioned before um, is dealing with this um, with this? parameters and this challenge when when reviewing and assessing the, the technology? It's a great question. And the short answer is that MRV for carbon removal is a big gap right now. And it's a gap that we need to fill. 
So we're a little bit building the plane as we're flying it. Um, and part of the challenge with MRV for this space is that there are such diversity in the kinds of technology. The way that you measure a ton uh, of removal for climbworks is very different than what you do for running tide, for kelp sinking, or for uh, bio oil injection. It's just different and for, or for enhanced rock weathering. I mean, it's all over the map. And so we need to one, develop as robust methodologies as possible for each of these different um, technologies to figure out how to operationalize that and scale that up. Um, and then, you know, three, figure out kind of where does all of this kind of like who pays for it? How does it live? There's like a, a number of, of sort of more tactical questions that are super, super important. Um, we are working with a number of folks across the industry right now to try and develop some of those and, and fill in some of those gaps that I just talk, talked about, but it's a gap right now. And I think that the, you know, traditional registries in many ways have, you know, not done the job that we want them to do. Um, and we need to figure out sort of how do we make sure that this that this field develops in as robust a way as possible. Yeah. And that's crudely agreed. Yeah. Um, and um, maybe another another question was if we consider this whole ecosystem, right? Um, do you intend to work with other stakeholders? Um, for instance, one question was um, if we think about companies as tech developers, right? Um, are there any special tools or project that could work for project developers, for instance, or you're working with anyone who would deliver the, the CDR uh, at the end of the day? Or do you envision working with governments or institution at some point? Um, what, what are your thoughts around that? All of the above. I think we are sort of flexible on vision and um, stubborn on vision and flexible on the strategy, right? So uh, this is very different, obviously, than building a single company. This is building an ecosystem. And so if one part of the ecosystem gets stuck, everybody gets stuck. Um, we are very open to and actively working on a number of, you know, to, on a range of formal to informal partnerships um, to, to sort of unstuck the various pieces of the field, right? So on the policy side of things, if you think about this as just, you know, supply and demand on the demand side of things, we have to get this to, you know, a hundred billion dollar plus per year market. We're going to have to have policy there. And we want to make sure that that policy is technology neutral and inclusive of all of the different kinds of innovation that we are starting to see in the space. So there's a, there's a, we just hired Jane Flagel who came from the White House um, and she'll be working with us and leading our, our policy and market development efforts there. On the supply side, um, we have announced last year uh, by a Stripe Climate, a partnership with Activate and um, Deep Science Ventures that we would be the first customer for any companies that come out of their startup incubators um, for a $500,000 pre-purchase agreement. So we are trying to go up funnel to get more companies and um, entrepreneurs into this space. Um, and then on the ecosystem side of things, um, we are, and there we hired uh, Frauke, who's going to be uh, leading our science efforts. She's coming from Stanford and um, Scott Litzelman from RPE is our program director. Um, and then on the ecosystem side of things, there's, uh, you know, a lot of work that we have to do around the MRV piece. Um, Zeke's going to be helping with some of that. And then finally, on the commercialization side of the house, you know, project developers and investors, like I would love to figure out how do we shave years off of these companies having to put together these bespoke unique packages, or at least, you know, even if they're still bespoke, how do we make that go faster? So Hannah and Joanna are going to be spending a bunch of their time figuring out what are the kinds of, um, how can we make it easier for founders to go from first prototype to start and starting to scale up um, through, you know, work we've spoken with the folks at Generate, we've spoken um, with a number of the banks to, to sort of start to think about how we can um, make that easier for founders, especially who come from science backgrounds. Excellent. And one of one of one of the topic maybe building on that is: Do you have any indication on how far the technology has to be to, for you to make a pre-purchase, or is it related to the timing of delivery that you mentioned before? The spirit is that we want them to actually be removing tons. Right. So 
we want to be able to buy something from them in the next couple of years. And we're fine if that's a ton a day or, you know, 50 tons in a year. It doesn't have to be a huge volume, but we want it to be more than just bench scale. Um, and so that's the, that's sort of the, this, the spirit is like, we want enough tonnage that we can buy $500,000 ish worth of carbon removal. Yeah. And do you already have an idea about kind of the, how the budget would be spread across different type of technologies or is this, is this? Really no, different? no. It's, it, yeah. I mean, I think that the spirit is that we want to mature a portfolio of solutions. So what we, you know, a billion dollars is at once a big amount of money, but also a small amount of money, right? Like if we can't, if the world can't spend a billion dollars by, you know, by 2030, we have a bigger problem, right? Like that <laughs> carbon removal is like probably, you know, is, is, is facing larger challenges. So we hope that a billion dollars by 2030, by the way, is not most of the market. Um, we don't want to spend, you could easily spend a billion dollars on like a single offtake agreement from, you know, depending on how long-term it is and how large the facility is. We want to really foster a portfolio across different technologies. But right now, I don't, think we really know what is going to win, right? We're, we're, and, and whether one is even going to win, I think that that's probably not what, what the end result will look like anyways, but there are a lot of unknowns and we want to make sure to, to foster a portfolio. I couldn't tell you though, like there, there isn't a, a percentage marked for like enhanced rock weathering versus DAC. We don't have that. Well, we kind of need many winners anyway, right? Given exactly. the scale of the challenge. And one of the questions from the audience is, do you foresee that at some point also nature-based solution will be able to meet the criteria that you've outlined? We care less what it's called. We just care that it meets the criteria. criteria. So yeah, if it if, if it's more than a, th yeah, like you could argue that, you know, um, running tide is, nature based they're growing kelp and sinking it but it doesn't take up arable land and we think that there are you know that the permanence issues are are um are tractable so i don't i, I think that there's sort of this false bifurcation in nature versus engineered or nature, nature versus tech i think we're going to start to see some really interesting solutions at the intersection of those two different spaces but like trees i can't imagine a world where like trees would be in scope yeah, probably. Okay. Um, maybe another question from the audience. We have a very engaged audience. That's amazing. One of the questions, like, what's your from your experience at Sky Climate and and now what you the world you're leading with with frontiers? Like, what is the advice or a couple of pieces of advice you would have for people who now want to work on carbon removal, on climate, and especially on the scalar part of things? Any advice for those people? Um, I mean, great. Like we need all the talent that we can get. Um, I think the things to just like be cognizant of when you're, it really, I, I can't answer that point, that, that sort of question point blank. It depends on what your skill sets are, what your interests are, where you live, all those kinds of things. But, um, I think that a lot of times for folks who are moving, especially from tech into climate, there is this sort of, um, sometimes like aversion to hard, hard tech or hardware or like real physical things. I think that like you, one of the things that is true about carbon removal and as is true of a lot of different parts of the climate challenge, that these are infrastructure questions. Um, they are really important ones, but they, they're not going to scale at the same time as it, uh, in the same time frame as like a, um, the scale won't look exactly like software scale, up, right? It'll just look, it'll look different, but I wouldn't shy away from that. I think we know what we have to do. So let's figure out how we can do that robustly and more quickly. Um, I guess the other piece that I would think about is, you know, you can approach the job search from the sort of bottoms up capacity of like looking for open roles on a website. And that's fine. The problem with that is because all of these industries are still so young, you're going to miss a lot of things. So the other way to do it is approach top down and say, okay, what does the world need? Okay, well, what are the gaps right now? Where is the best place for me to fill this gap? Is it at an existing company? Is, should I go start my own thing? Is it in policy? Is it in, you know, I think that taking the top down approach, at least for me, has helped kind of expand my aperture of the types of 
opportunities that are really going to be needle moving. Yeah, I, I love one advice you gave once, um, thing maybe last year. It's like start with the questions, right? So start yeah. with the questions you wanna you wanna get answered because it's very easy to get drawn to some extent, you know, with the existing literature and the challenge at hand can sometimes feel overwhelming. But I I, I often refer to this advice of like start with the questions. What's yeah. your question you want to get solved, and then and then take it from there. Um, totally. Great. One one other question is one of the criteria is that you outlined before is for solutions to have a path towards about a hundred dollar a ton price target. Um, how did you guys establish or land on that price? And do you believe that all the solutions will meet it? Um, should it reach it and why? It's a little bit like this. I mean, a hundred dollars is not intended to be overly precise. The point is like, it needs to be, they need to be way cheaper than they are today. And the thinking is that over time, the carbon markets and the sort of price per ton that either exists in the existing market or that governments um, create when we start adequately pricing the negative externality of a ton of emissions will, you know, many economists would argue that if you, if you actually price it at the social cost of carbon, it is like many hundreds of dollars per ton. Um, so a hundred dollars is really intended to define or at least point to a number that is lower um, ish, but I don't know if it's going to be 150 or $50. It could be either. We just like make them as we want it as cheap as we can get it. Okay, cool. Um, maybe one question we had from the audience on the ecosystem. So going back to what you were saying earlier, one of the questions um, someone has is, okay, if I'm a technology provider or I'm more on the capture part, would, would Frontier be able to make a connection to a storage partner, for instance? Yeah. That's, is that a, even if they don't have anything to sell yet, is that something you could enable? Yes, and it's something that we are actively working on. Um, so we have, we're, 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 we're gonna probably rework how we're handling storage for the next, um, the next round, but we are excited and very interested in considering, like if you have a really innovative capture technology and you don't have a storage partner, please reach out to us. Um, we will do our best to try to connect the dots and vice versa. I mean, in the US, part of the you know, problem is that getting access to wells and like permitting for class six wells is really challenging. So like, if you are a storage partner in the US, um, we would love to talk to you as well about connecting you with some of our, um, our portfolio companies on the capture side of that. So definitely. Excellent. So that's a big yes. Thanks for that. Um, one other question was, um, that goes back a bit more to the origin. And I think that's valid for Stripe Climate and Frontier is, um, how do you see the storage, which is your focus, permanent storage versus, um, upcycling, right. Or reusing the carbon that would be capture. Why focusing on, on the storage part? The reason that we focus on the storage on the, the sort of the S part rather than the U part um, to date is really because we are trying to focus our efforts where we where we see the biggest gap is um, currently. So we are not convinced that we're going to be get, able to get close to the six gigaton number with CCU um, with the utilization piece. And in the same way, you know, we, we, we're, we think trees are important and we think the utilization piece is also important. It's just that, that for, especially for the utilization piece, there are already customers for that. So being an early customer isn't as catalytic. And we've really tried to focus our efforts on where, you know, the area that, that has been the most in need um, to give you a sense of the rationale. Yeah. Um, we'll close with like maybe the last two or three questions on policy. What would you say, um, you know, are the maybe top three or most critical element that policy needs to address first? It depends on where, where we are, but I tend to think about, um, I tend to think about policy in a couple of different buckets. The first is on the demand side. We are going to need policy to create a large enough compliance market to scale carbon removal to multiple gigatons a year. A voluntary market is very unlikely to get us to that scale. So global policy needs to be working to whether it's 
you know, through direct federal procurement or whether it is through pricing the negative externality of emissions, we have to get to the point where policy is, is making the market. Um, the voluntary market can only sustain that for so long. Um, the, the second piece is on the supply side um, of things. How can we make it faster for these companies to build in robust way? Like environmental justice concerns are, um, are, are, are extremely relevant and extremely important. And we need, to take, we need to continue to develop robustly, but we also need to develop quickly. So how can we make sure that we can um, amp up the speed um, as well as maintaining quality? And I think that the final piece is maybe like ecosystem, a couple of things ecosystem wide. We need all this policy to be technology neutral. So like, let's define the criteria of what we want to see, but be open to innovation in a lot of different areas. Um, so, so sort of criteria specific, but technology agnostic. Um, and then, you know, also in that ecosystem bucket around measurement and verification, I think that that, that is still an unknown and governments can help play a role there. Um, but it's, you know, a little TBD on, on, I think maybe the private sector needs to get it a bit further before policy can, can act um, super meaningfully there. I'm not sure. A lot of homework indeed. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, the work you've been doing at Stripe and then collectively with the Frontier Group is really inspiring. And do you expect like more um, AMC um, vehicles to appear or maybe in other areas of the climate, you know, fight like could be the case, for instance, for um, sustainable aviation fuel, you know, that, that we know is a topic, but hasn't emerged as a large adoption um, yet, or hydrogen, for instance, is that something, um, you know, you've been hearing about or what are your thoughts on that? In the context of carbon removal, we are taking you know, more buyers, the better. Our intention with Frontier is to make it easy for any company that is making a climate commitment in which carb permanent carbon removal is part of it. We wanna make it easier for you to implement and execute on that, right? So we're starting with this 925 million, but the intention is that it is just a start and we need to add you know, at least another zero to it. Um, and, and so that's through a combination of, of companies and, um, and governments. So uh, that is very much the intention with Frontier specifically. With other um, areas of climate, yes, I think there are some specific areas of climate that an AMC would benefit from, whether it's, you know, steel, hydrogen, um, SAF. There are some AMC-like, they're not even vehicles, but like um, coalitions that are forming, right? So First Movers Coalition, um, breakthrough catalyst. There are a number of different coalitions, and I think I believe there's one um, that the airline community is working on for sustainable aviation fuels. I think it would be an AMC-like structure could make that more robust and accelerate it, make it go faster. But I think that some of these other areas um, have initial commitment that is trying to achieve a similar goal that an AMC tries to achieve. But yes, yeah, so if that's something you're interested in. Um, please reach out. It's something I've been thinking about too. Perfect. Um, great. Look, maybe, you know, I, I wanted to wrap up by sharing some highlights or like key takeouts that I've heard you say. Um, the first one would be how this is like a true multifunctional effort into an ecosystem. And I think that's really, you know, something that resonates also with, with Climeworks and the summit efforts, for instance, we've been leading really. So it's really about, you know, leveraging the power of corporations, but that's not possible, you know, alone. It's really bringing uh, the different type of expertise, the different policy in the private and public sector, different type of technology that will enable us to address this challenge at hand. Um, I think that that's really the, the number one thing that I take out from from this conversation and you know also what you just said about the policy that that applies to policy and beyond right how do we find we're in a stage now where the challenge at the hand is so huge and so urgent right that we need to progress really fast but also in a very robust way um, and and have the right criteria that go across different type of technology and then that sense really being 
technology agnostic. Um, so it's really the time for action. And I think, you know, the action of Frontier and this conversation were really inspiring for me, but also for everyone judging from the question that keep on, on happening. So I really, really want to thank you for taking the time um, and the energy of not only today, but, you know, all the efforts leading up to here and, and everything that's coming and that's coming next. So thank you very much. Um, we'll be we'll be looking forward to hearing more from uh, from Frontier and all the learnings and experience and decision that are made uh, into the vehicle and all the also inspiration that it creates in the climate space and, and beyond. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for all the work that you all have done pioneering uh, uh, carbon removal and DAC specifically. So uh, you've been a, a big convener in the space as well. I know it is. So big thank you to the audience as well. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. I think I try to cover most of the question that, that were asked in the chat. Um, for more insight, you can watch this again, but also you can tune in into the panels for the Director Capture Summit in a bit more than four weeks uh, from now and continue the conversation um, with Climeworks, with uh, Stripe, with Frontier, with all the actors that are uh, driving this. So thank you very much. Thank you.